We're on Daf Ayin Gimel Amid Aleph with the two dots. This is a Gemara where you have to hold cup again. In other words, there's going to be a few twists and turns, but you got to keep a few things in your head. Okay. Shachto Shalola Ochlov. The Mishnah had said that if you slaughter the Korban Pesach for the wrong people, and you, uh, the only people that you're thinking of are people who are either uh, physically incapable of eating the Korban Pesach or are halachically incapable of eating the Korban Pesach. So we know that such a Korban is puzzle, and as a result of its being puzzle, if you do this on Shabbos, when Erev Pesach falls out on Shabbos, you've done a malacha. Because you haven't done anything that's... Uh, the Torah only mandates the Korban Shechitas Korban Pesach on Shabbos, but you haven't shechted a Korban Pesach, it's not kosher. So therefore you've done a malacha. So the Gemara says, Pshita, Kevin de Hasam Pasel HaChachayev. The Gemara says that should be self-evident. You know, we have a whole Mishnah in the previous parak that tells us explicitly that if you shecht it for the wrong people exclusively, so then it's a puzzle carbon. So once you know it's a puzzle carbon, of course you're Machal Shabbos if you do it on Shabbos. Why do you need the Mishnah to tell you that? The Gemara answers, Mishum de Tana Seifa Potter Tana Reish Shachayev. Answers the Gemara because, because the second part of the Mishnah is going to tell me that if I have at least one person in mind who's kosher, even if I have a mixture of some people who are puzzled, some people who are kosher for the carbon Pesach, as, li- as long as there's at least one person that's capable of eating the carbon Pesach, I have him in mind, so then, it's a, so then I haven't done a malacha. So then, that's for, for consistency, I listed the first part as well. But the Gemara says, V'hanami pshita, mishum dahasam kosher hachapater. But the Gemara says, but that should also be self-evident and unnecessary to write, because after all, once we have a Mishnah that tells us that it's a kosher carbon Pesach, as long as I had at least one person who's proper in mind, then obviously I haven't done a malacha. So the Gemara says, So the Gemara says, you're right. The whole second part of this Mishnah is superfluous and unnecessary. Uh, the, the, the real reason why the Mishnah says Shalom La'ochlov, that it talks about shechting it for the wrong people, is because the, in the previous parak we had two Mishnayas that were listed consecutively. The first one talked about shechting the Korban Pesach Shalom Lishmo. And then right afterwards we talked about shechting it Shalom La'ochlov for the wrong people. So because over there we put those two together, we put them together over here too. But the reality is the whole function of this mission is to tell me the halacha when I shech the carbon pesach shalol ishmo to, on Shabbos to tell me that I've done a malacha, and that's the point of the mission. The stylistic thing. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, we, we, it's just like over there in the previous parak, we put together shalol ishmo and shalol ochlov. In this parak, we also put together shalol ishmo and shalol ochlov. <coughs> Bless you. But then the Gemara says vehi gufalamali. So the Gemara says, but that too is unnecessary. It's a very straightforward halacha. When you shech the Korban Pesach Shalom Lishmo, it's puzzle. So obviously if it's puzzle, you're doing a malacha on Shabbos. So again, we're back to square one. Why do you need to write any of this? The Gemara answers Mishum to Kaboy Li Fluge Rabbi Eliezer the Rabbi Yehoshua. So the real answer is because there's one added facet of this mission that we would not have gotten previously. Our Mishnah talks about a machlokas between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua when I take an animal that was not designated as a carbon Pesach. It was designated for some other carbon. And it's, it's the right species it's, and everything. It fits the criteria for a carbon Pesach, but it was designated, for let's say, for a Shlomim. Mm-hmm. If I shecht it for the, sh- the sake of a carbon Pesach, <clears throat> so the halacha is that I'm called a Toa Bidvar Mitzvah. Since this carbon is still kosher as a Shlomim, mm-hmm. I've done a malacha that the Torah does not permit me to do on Shabbos, but I've done it in the course of doing a shtikel mitzvah, like we, like Rashi explained on the Mishnah. And this is the machlokas between Rabbi Yez and Rabbi Yoshua. Do we say that a toa bidvar mitzvah, a person who, who erroneously is machal Shabbos in the course of doing a mitzvah, does he have to bring a korban chattis for that malacha or not? Rabbi Eliezer says you do, and Rabbi Yoshua says you do not. So really, all of the other cases of the Mishnah were only listed for the sake of comprehensiveness of, in providing me this one chiddush, this one halacha. Fine. Amr le Rav Huna bar chinana liberei. Ki azlis lakamei de Rebbe Zreika bo iminei. So Rav Huna says to his son, he says, when you go to appear before Rebbe Zreika, I want you to ask him the following question. Ledivrei haomer mekalkel bechabura pator, shechatur shlo laoch lov chayiv matike. I have a very simple question. We know that there's a discussion in the Gemara and Shabbos that at least according to one opinion, and that's actually the opinion that we Paskin like, if a person does an act of mikalkel, 
He does a destructive act, which means that he does an act which has no constructive outcome. Then even though he's done a pro forma malacha, he's not, that's not really called a malacha, because a malacha, by definition, has to have a constructive outcome. So therefore, the question is as follows. Since you did an act of shechita, which has no constructive outcome, because this animal that you've shechted is, com- is going to be completely puzzle. In the case of where you shechted it shalol la for example, or shalol lishma, it's completely puzzle. The question is, now all you're left with is a dead animal. What constructive thing has come out of this for which you should be liable for doing, for doing a malacha? Granted, you did an act of shechita, which is a malacha, but there's no constructive outcome. Normally when you do an act of shechita, the constructive outcome is now you have a kosher animal. But now this behemoth is puzzle. Is there's nothing you can do with it. So why is this not called an, an act of makalkel for which you should be putter from a carbon chatis? Can you benefit from it at all? Like use the skin or something? Um, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It could be that I think the halacha is, is that you have to completely incinerate it, as we'll see later on. So the Gemara says, Ma tikein, so what did you do that was constructive? So the Gemara says, Tikein im alu lo yerdu. The answer is, is that we paskin by Kudshim that even when, when you, if I shech the carbon and even if the carbon is puzzle, I'm not allowed to do anything with it. But bidievet, if I took its emurim, if I took its innards and I placed it on the mizbeach, they are not taken down. So at least I've created some level of, of constructive outcome such that I've brought it one step closer to the mizbeach in a bidievet situation. That's the constructive act that I've done. Now, shechato v'nim sabal mumchay of matikein. But, okay, fine. But then the Mishnah had said that if I shecht it and I discover that it's a blemished animal, mm-hmm. then I'm also liable for a chatas. But what act of tikkun did I do? Because there, if an animal is a balmum, which has, has an intrinsic blemish to it, so then even if I take the innards and place it on the mizbech, I have to remove it. So I haven't done anything constructive there. So why am I liable for a chatas? So the Gemara says, Tikein bedukin shebaayin valiba de Rabbi Akiva de Amar im alolo yerdu. There is a certain kind of mum that, according to Rabbi Akiva, even though it's not usable as a carbon, if, however, its innards are placed on the mizbeach, you don't take the innards down, and that's a case where the animal's blemish is in an inconspicuous part of the body, which he defines as in the white of the eye. If the blemish is there, since it's not a conspicuous blemish. It's, it's granted it's not kosher, but at the same time, im alu lo yerdu, if its innards are placed on the mizbech, you don't take them off. So that's the act of tikkun that our mission is talking about. Shechato v'nim treifa b'seser pater. The next part of the Mishnah had said, if, however, I shecht it, and I discover that it has a treifa, that it's like, say, tuberculosis, or something like that, which makes it unusable as a carbon, so then I'm going to be pater. I'm not going to be liable for a carbon chatis because there was no way for me to know. But the by implication, habigolu chayav. But if the animal was a trefa conspicuously on it, on its exterior, so then if I go ahead and shech this and I'm chayav because I should have known, I should have seen it. Like for example, let's say the animal's walking funny, right? And I could have checked it to see that oh well, there's some, obviously it's diseased or it's got a broken limb and it's not usable as a carbon. So then I'm going to be liable. I have to bring a carbon chatas in that case. But the question therefore there is matike. But what did I do there? It's not allowed to be used. If, if it goes on the Mizbech, it has to be removed. So what, what act of tikkun did I do? So the more answer is, tikkun lahotzi midei nevela. So there is another tikkun that I did. My tikkun is that I've alleviated its status of being nevela. Because when an animal has the din of a nevela, if it dies of natural causes, it transmits tumah. The fact that I've shechted it alleviates it of that transmission of tumah. So the Gemara now says, so maskif Ravina. So, let me ask you the following question. According to that argument, there's a brisa that says that if you shech the carbon chatas, an animal that was designated as your personal carbon chatas, and that, that's not allowed to be brought on Shabbos, you go ahead and you shech it on Shabbos, but to make things worse, you shech it outside the temple, and you shech it for avodah zara. You do all these things b'shoh geg. Okay? So if that's the case, then you have to bring three korbanos chatas, one for Chilol Shabbos, one for Shechut Eichutz, for shechting an animal outside the temple, and one for shechting for Avodah Zara. So there the question is, Ma tikin? What tikkun did you do over there for which you should be liable uh, for Chilol Shabbos? 
there you're not even alleviating it of its tuma, because when you shecht something for avodah zara, that too transmits tuma. So granted, you may have alleviated it from its tumas nevela, but there's still tuma on it. So there, there doesn't seem to be any tikkun at all. So why do you have to bring a chatas for bechilol shabbos? Amar avavira shemotzi o mide aver min hachai. The answer is that you alleviate it of its status of aver min hachai, such that if someone were to take a bite out of this animal now, once you've shechted it, he's not going to be liable for aver min hachai from eating from a live animal. So that in itself is an act of tikkun, and that's the conclusion of the Gemara, that any time you shecht an animal, even if you were to shoot an animal, right, the fact is you've done some act of tikkun, because it's no longer aver min You can say that by any potential of error of any kind, of you've... Um... Well, it's, that's why it's hard to find an act of makalkel. The act of makalkel is the... Makalkel is to do a destructive act where there's no constructive outcome. So there we say that you're that you're putter, but you have to be able to define that it is to fit, for sure a makalkel. Here the Gemara is suggesting no, there is no kilkel here because any time you do an act of shechita, you've alleviated some kind of prohibition off of the animal. But let's say there are certain kinds of makalkel. Let's say I take a bottle and I just smash it on the ground. That's, that's not, there's no constructive outcome there. So even though you might, might argue that I've done a malacha of some sort, I can't be held liable because it's completely de- destructive. Right, but that act. You could say, well, I, uh, I, pre- I, I prevented somebody from, uh, from uh, moving something that, uh, that could have been moksa because the bottle, you know I mean, it, it sort of... You have to make the argument. The Gemara does suggest that if a person does it uh, to abate their anger, mm-hmm. then you could argue that that's not an act of makalakel. Okay. But under normal circumstances, if I just stam as I do it, then there is... But again, you're right. What the Gemara is basically demonstrating is that the, the argument of being getting off because of an act of makalkel is very limited. Let us go weiter. Shechato v'no da v'chulay. Let's say you shech the animal, and then you discover that the owner, the person who is, the, who is being represented, or the group of people who are being represented, either have died, or have used another animal for the Korban Pesach, or are tame and cannot use this animal. So then the halacha is, even though this Korban Pesach is puzzle, <laughs> because it can't be used because it's ownerless, Nevertheless, you're off the hook for being Mechal Shabbos because there was no way for you to know. How were you supposed to know? So the Gemara now says, Amar Rav Huna, Amar Rav, Asham Shanitak L'Ri'iya, Ushchato Stam Kasher L'Oila. So Rav makes the statement that we're going to be spending the rest of the day with. And his statement is having to do with an animal. Animal A was designated as a carbon Asham. Now, there, I just want to define, a carbon asham is a guilt offering, it's a certain specific kind of guilt offering. There's another kind of guilt offering called the carbon chata. So you're familiar with those two terms, a chatas and an asham. Uh, the halacha is, is that if an animal was designated as a carbon chatas, and the owner is no longer present, or the owner was able to get a kapara through a different animal, let's say this animal was lost, and so he replaced it with another animal, and then, he find, he, then the animal wanders back in. So since he's already gotten an atonement, or there's no longer a person around, so this carbon, this animal that was designated for carbon chatas has to die. There's nothing you can do with it. You stick it in a barn, and you can't actively kill it. You stick it in a barn, and it has to die of starvation. That's the law by a carbon chatas. By a carbon asham, the halacha is not that way. An animal was designated as an asham, and it gets lost. So you replace it with asham B, and then all of a sudden, asham A shows up later. So the halacha by Asham A, the animal that's set aside for Asham A, is that it will lose its status. You, you, you don't have to kill it. It will lose its status as being a carbon Asham. But what do you have to do? Then under normal circumstances, what you're required to do is let it go out into the field, let it graze. It'll develop a mum, it'll develop a blemish. Then you have permission to sell it. And you take the proceeds, those, that money, which is now kadosh, the kedusha of that animal is passed on to the money, and you, trans, you, you use that money to purchase another animal, which will be used for a voluntary carbon, usually a, car, a carbon nadava, which is usually an ola. That's the protocol that is normally prescribed by Chazal for a carbon asha. But Rav says a big chiddush over here. He says, in reality the animal loses its status as a carbon asham automatically once the owner has already received the kapara, or once this animal is no longer needed as an asham. It really loses its status automatically, and therefore Rav makes the interesting statement. He says once that animal is taken out 
to pasture to hopefully develop a mum sometime in the future, if a person were to jump the gun and slaughter that animal, then the animal would, and without having any thoughts whatsoever, since the animal has automatically reverted to being a non-asham, once it's no longer needed as an asham, the animal can be placed on the Mizbeach as a carbon ola now. That's what Rav's statement is, okay? It's, a pretty, it's pretty straightforward, but now it's gonna, we're going to go into, through some twists and turns. So, Alma Kesavra lo boi akira. So you see from here that Rav holds that once an animal is no longer usable for its original purpose, it automatically reverts to the alternate use without requiring a proactive redesignation, without requiring the person to say, okay, it's now an Ola. It was an Asham, now it's an Ola. You know, you don't need that. Because since he shechts it stamazoi, since he shechts it without any thoughts whatsoever, the fact that it's automatically reverted to an ola means you don't have to proactively redesignate. So frek the Gemara ihachi kilo nitek nami. Frek the Gemara, well, if that's the case, then why did he specifically talk about a case where the animal was put out to pasture? Even if the animal has not yet been put out to pasture, the very fact that this is as no longer needed as my asham should automatically make it revert into an ola. Why, do you, why does it dafka where he talks about where it was put out to pasture and then I shecht? The Gemara says, kapara kapara. Answers the Gemara, technically that's true. Once it's no longer needed as an asham, it automatically reverts even before I put it out to pasture. But Chazal made a takana that if you shecht it before you put it out to pasture, you can't use it. Why? Because we're worried that if we allow you to do it, if, you, if, you were, if we were to permit that animal in that situation, a person might really jump the gun and take this animal, which was asham A, and shecht it even before he had a chance to shecht Asham B. In other words, we're talking about a potential situation as follows. Guy lost Asham A, the animal for Asham A, and he, and he replaces it with Asham B, animal B. So he's, even before animal B is shechted, the Kohen comes along and says, oh, Asham A, the guy doesn't need it anymore. He found Asham B. But little does he know that Asham B hasn't yet even been offered. And in that situation, Asham A retains its status as an Asham. It only loses its status once the owner has brought Asham B. So in order to avoid that tragic situation where Asham A still has its status as an Asham and he thinks it's, that it's a carbonola, we say across the board, only after you physically put it into the pasture to show that it's, you've already gotten your kapara with Asham B, do we allow you to consider it an Ola? Okay? In that case, though, does Asham B lose its status as an Asham once you find A before you've shechted B? Well, that's a good question. I think, in, I think what we conclude is that you have a choice of using either Asham A or Asham B. I think that's the halacha, because basically both Asham A and B have a status of being an Asham. You've designated them both as an Asham. You choose which one you want to use. And then you let the other one go out to the to out, go out to pasture and develop a mum. It's not done as a tanai. No. So the Gemara now says uminat temra. Where do you see that Chazal makes such a takana? In other words, where do you have an indication from some kind of mishneic source that we have such a concern? Ditnan ashem shemesu ba'olav o shenisgapru ba'olav yira ad sheistoyev v'yimacher v'yiplu dam of linadava. The Mishnah says that if a korban asham. Uh, was designated, and then the owner dies, or they were able to find another animal to bring the asham for. So then, this original animal, this animal A, has to graze until it develops a mum, <coughs> use the proceeds, sell it, and use the proceeds to purchase uh, a carbon adava. Rabbi Eliezer Omer Yamos. Rabbi Eliezer disagrees, and he says no. The original asham has to die because he holds that there's no difference between the chatas and the asham, just like by the carbon chatas. There's no remedy for that animal that's a chatas that's no longer needed. So too, there's no remedy for the asham animal that's no longer needed. Rabbi Yehoshua Omer, Yimacher v'yavi bedam of Ola. And Rabbi Yehoshua says the animal has to be sold, and you should use with its proceeds and purchase an Ola. Now, the Gemara concludes really that Rabbi Yehoshua and the Tanakama, for our purposes at least for now, are essentially saying the same thing. So, but the, what the Gemara wants to infer from this is, is as follows: Bedam of in of al gufa lo. But you see from this Mishnah that you're not really supposed to use the original animal, the original asham animal that is no longer usable as an asham, 
you can't use that animal itself as the ola. You have to sell it. Why is that? L'chora, the animal can lose its original designation as an asham since you no longer need it. So just convert it to an ola. So what you see from here is the gazel achar kapara atu lifnei kapara. You see that the sages were concerned that if we allow you to just willy-nilly just convert this animal into an asham, into an ola rather, you might do that before he even offers his other asham animal and when it still retains its status of an asham. And therefore they said you have to let it develop a mum and let it gra- graze, develop a mum and sell it. So you see that that's the concern of Chazal. And so once that's the concern of Chazal, Rav would say the same thing. Even though you were supposed to let this animal graze and develop a mum, you didn't. Lamaisa, you didn't. But at least what Rav still requires is you only can uh, consider it to be an ola once it's sent out to pasture to graze. Shema mina. So that's, uh, so that's what we're inferring from that whole discussion. So Eisve, Rav Chista, Ravuna. So Rav Chizda challenges Rav Huna's citation of Rav's halacha as follows. Now let's look at our Mishnah. You shecht the carbon Pesach on Shabbos, and you discover after you shechted it that the owner had used another carbon as their carbon Pesach, or that the owner died. So what do you see from there? The Tani Allah, there's a brisa that adds, provides an addendum to our Mishnah, and it says as follows. Bechol ki haigavna yisarif miyad. That if this were to take place not on Shabbos, forget about Shabbos for a second. You went ahead and you shechted an animal that was a carbon pesach that is now ownerless, so the animal is puzzled. So the halacha is that in that situation you have to burn you burn the animal right away. Since it's puzzled, you burn it right away. Now the question is as follows: What is the status of this animal? You shechted it to be a carbon pesach. And it's really not needed as a carbon pesach. Now, according, let's think about this for a second. According to Rav, once you no longer need an animal for its designated purpose, it immediately reverts to its secondary designation without me having to do anything at all. So, this asham automatically reverts to being an ola, and therefore, if I shechted it, it can be placed on the mizbeach as an ola. Fantastic. By the same token, you should argue that if I take a carbon that was designated as a carbon Pesach and it's no longer needed, well, what's the halacha of, a, of an extraneous, of a Mosar Pesach, of an extra carbon Pesach, an extra animal that is not needed for carbon Pesach, that automatically should revert into a Shlomim. Because that's the normal halacha, that if I have a leftover animal that was not needed for my carbon Pesach, it reverts into a carbon Shlomim. So according to Rav, that happens automatically without any, uh, any proactive or explicit designation. So this animal should be considered a shlomim. The question then becomes, why am I allowed to incinerate it right away? And here's the issue. So the Gemara says, Iomart bishlam aboy akira hai pesachu v'kevin delesle ba'olam havalei psulo begof v'amatolacha yisarif miyad. He says, if you were to argue, not like Rav says, but rather that in order for this animal to lose its status as a pesach, there has to be a proactive, explicit designation. This is no longer a Pesach. This is now a Shlomim. If that were the halacha, not like Rav says, then I could understand why you would have the uh, uh, mandate to burn it right away. Because there are two different kinds of disqualification in a carbon. One is called a, a, a puzzle de gufo, when, it, when it's intrinsically puzzle, like a carbon Pesach that can no longer be used. And one is a type of sulb which is extrinsic, which means that it's, it's a problematic carbon, but not because of an intrinsic disqualification, but rather because of a separate halacha that is extrinsic to the animal that precludes me from being able to offer it. And if this animal is a shlamim, then the preclusion of this animal is not intrinsic to the animal. It's a perfectly fine shlamim. There's only one thing that stops me from offering this animal on Erev Pesach, which is the fact that I'm offering it at the wrong time of the day, as the Gemara is going to speak out. So here, if you're going to tell me that the animal automatically reverts to a shlamim, like Rav would be suggesting, then the soul of this animal is extrinsic. 
It's not intrinsic. What is the extrinsic psul? It's that I've already offered the Tamit Shal Bein Harbayim. The only carbon we learned previously, a couple prakim ago, the only carbon that I'm allowed to offer after the Tamit Shal Bein Harbayim is what? Is the carbon Pesach. I'm not, I'm not allowed to bring a carbon Shlamim after the Tamit Shal Bein Harbayim. So if that's the case, that's the only preclusion of this animal from being offered well then, I shouldn't be allowed to burn it right away in its normal state. Ibor tzura boy. I should have to wait for the animal to rot somewhat, which is called Ibor tzura. It has to change its appearance by de- decomposing somewhat before you're allowed to burn it, because it's considered to be a bizayon to kachim, a desecration of sacrificial items, that if something does not have an intrinsic disqualification to burn it in its normal state. Rather, you have to wait till it decomposes a little bit, and only then are you allowed to destroy it. The Tanya is a because as the mission, as the Bryce had taught, that the general rule is kol shipsulo begufo yisarf miyad, but bedamo v'balim to uber tsuraso v'yetsi lebeis asreifa. The rule is is that if something, if an animal carbon has an intrinsic psul, then you can incinerate it right away. But if it has an extrinsic reason why you can't bring it as a carbon, such as, the two examples are, let's say it's a perfectly kosher carbon, I did the Kabbalah, I received the blood of the animal, and before I had a chance to do Zerika, all the blood spilled out and was lost. Carbon's for fallen, it's gone. I can't use this carbon anymore. But that's not an intrinsic psul. It's extrinsic. The preclusion of bringing it on the altar is not because there's anything wrong with the animal, but just because I lost the, the blood. Another example is, is that if the owner, after I, before I had a chance to do the zrika, but after I shechted it, the owner dies. So in that situation as well, since the owner died, this, this carbon has no function anymore. But it's not an intrinsic disqualification, it's extrinsic because, it's, because this animal is now ownerless, there's no owner to it. So the Gemara says that, the Bryce says that in that situation, you have to wait till the, um, the meat decomposes somewhat before you're allowed to burn it. So you have to like wait a day or two. The, but the bottom line is, is that the Brisa doesn't make any sense according to Rav. According to Rav, if the transition between being an Ashram to a non-Ashram is automatic without any proactive designation, so then the transition between Pesach and non-Pesach should also be automatic. And therefore, the, this animal should, when I shechted it, and it's ownerless, should have a status of a shlomim. If it has the status of a shlomim, I shouldn't be allowed to incinerate it right away. I should be obligated to wait until it decomposes before I'm permitted to incinerate it. That's the Gemara's question. Isn't the disintegration of the meat a considered disgusting? We don't usually bring a disgusting, put a disgusting thing onto the mizbeah. Precisely. You're not allowed, when I say incinerate, I don't mean on the mizbeah. Oh. You incinerate it to destroy it. Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ella lo teimashchato stam kasher l'shum ola, Ella eimashchato l'shum ola kasher, and Alma boy Akira. So the Gemara says we made a mistake. Rav never said that the transition from an asham to becoming a non asham is automatic. That's not what Rav said. Really, what Rav said that if you want to transition this animal from an asham to a non asham you have to proactively, explicitly designate it's no longer an asham, it's now an ola. And therefore, you do need akira. You do need to proactively transition and remove this animal from its original state in order for it to transition to its, to its new state. That, we, we got it totally opposite. So the Gemara now says, well, if that's the case, so let's unpack this a little bit. About 10 days ago, we learned about the Shita of Rabbi Chia Bar Gamda. He had said that when you have an animal that's a paschal lamb, and you want to, and you have this lamb, it's left over. It's in the middle of Cholamoid Pesach now. This animal, its status is assumed to be a carbon Pesach. In other words, it still retains its Paschal status. But that's only true if the owner of this lamb was Tame on Erev Pesach. If he was Tame on Erev Pesach, it retains the status of a carbon Pesach. Why? Because we assume he's going to need it for Pesach Sheni. So let's say a guy had designated a, a, a lamb as a carbon Pesach. He couldn't bring it on Yud Dalet because he was Tomei. 
So this animal will remain alive until Pesach Sheni one month later, and that's why it has the status of a Paschal lamb right now. But if, let's say, the guy had the leftover lamb not because he was Tame, he fulfilled his mitzvah of Korban Pesach, according to Rebchia Bar Gamda, this animal automatically loses its status of a Korban Pesach once the 14th of Nisan has elapsed. So the question now is, you see, according to Rebchia Bar Gamda, that a Korban Pesach automatically loses its status, it transitions from Pesach to non-Pesach, automatically. So this is a problem according to Rav. So Ela Amar Rav Huna Bere, the way that you're now saying Rav, right? So Ela Amar Rav Huna Bere, the Rav, the Rav Yehoshua, Hacha b'mayaskinan, kigon shehifrisho kodem chatzos, umesu ba'olim achar chatzos, to have a lenira v'nitche, v'chola nira v'nitche, shuv eno chozer v'nira. So the Gemara says, what you have to say is that really we're going to go back to our original answer. We, I, we retract our modification of Rav and go back to our original understanding of Rav, that by the case of the Asham, it automatically transitions from Asham to non-Asham, even without my explicit designation. So then why is it, Taka, that with a Korban Pesach, um, um, why is it that, um, that when, let's say I have, like Rashi says, V'chein Moser Pesach, Keben de l'shlamim koi, stomach yishochet l'shlamimu, and the same thing will be true by a carbon pesach that's left over. If I, if the, if it's ownerless, if this carbon pesach, then it automatically transitions into being a shlamim. Why then does the brisa say that I have to burn it? I, I, I burn it right away. I, if it's a shlamim, I should have to let it decompose before I'm allowed to burn it. So the Gemara answers because there it's talking about a specific case where this animal was designated as a Korban Pesach before Chatzos, and Chatzos arrives, and the animal is still a kosher Korban Pesach because the owner is still around. The owner passes away after Chatzos. And there, says the Gemara, Rav would agree that the animal permanently retains its status as a Korban Pesach and cannot transition into a non-Pesach. Why? Because since it was at a time when there was an obligation for, to bring it as a carbon Pesach, then it stuck with that status of carbon Pesach permanently. The only time that an animal can automatically lose its status as a carbon Pesach is if before Chatzos the owner dies. Since before Chatzos the owner dies and it not yet in, entered into the realm of, of obligation to offer it, only there does Rav agree that the carbon Pesach automatically transitions from Pesach to Shlomim. So that's why the Brisa says that you have the right to go ahead and burn it right away because it's talking about a case where the owner died after Chatzos, where the carbon permanently retains his status as a carbon Pesach. So therefore the Gemara says, but wait a minute, midi hu taima el rav rav enam nidchim. But one second, that can't be. Rav is the author of the statement that any living animal cannot be permanently precluded or assigned a permanent status. Any living animal's status can change. So therefore, even if the owner died after Chatzos, since this animal is still a living animal after Chatzos, then it is capable of losing its status because it's still alive. So that can't be the answer. We still are left with our quandary that if Rav holds that an animal automatically loses its status from Asham to non-Asham and from Pesach to non-Pesach, how can the Brisa tell me to burn it right away when I shechted it? The Gemara's answer is, Ela Amar Rav Papa Hamoni Rebbe Eliezer he Do Amar V'chein HaShochet Acherim L'Shem Pesach Posel Da Havale Pesulo Begufa The Gemara answers that that Brisa, which says burn it right away, goes according to Rebbe Eliezer. Rebbe Eliezer has a unique opinion. He argues with Rebbe Yoshua, also again about 11 or 12 days ago we saw this, that Rebbe Eliezer holds that if I take a carbon shlamin and I shecht it for the sake of a carbon Pesach, that animal is puzzle. It's not usable even for a shlamin, not like we had assumed. And therefore, the psul of this animal is a psul beguf, is an, in, an intrinsic psul, not an extrinsic psul. However, 
we don't paskin like Rabbi Eliezer, and Taka, according to us, we would not paskin like the Bryce, and we would say like Rabbi Yoshua, that you'd have to wait for the meat to decompose before you'd be allowed to burn it. Frek the Gemara, the E Rabbi Eliezer, he, chatos nomi michayev, the hales le Rabbi Eliezer to abidvar mitzvah pater. But one second, says the Gemara, this Brysa is an addendum to our Mishnah. Our Mishnah had said that if I go ahead and I shecht the Korban Pesach, uh, when there, which is ownerless, since I was in the process of doing a mitzvah because this animal is, is now potentially a Korban Shlamim, so then I'm Toa Bidvar Mitzvah and I'm Pater. But Rabbi Eliezer holds that a Toa Bidvar Mitzvah is Chayev. So how can this Brysa be an addendum? If it's going according to Rabbi Eliezer, how can it be an addendum to our Mishnah, which at this point is going like Rabbi Yehoshua? So the Gemara answers, El Atir Gemara Rav Yosef, Bereder of Salah Chasidah, Kameder of Papa, Hamani Yosef ben Chonoihi. Answers the Gemara, this Brysa goes according to a third Tana. It's not Rabbi Yehoshua, it's not Rabbi Eliezer, it's Rabbi Yosef, it's Yosef ben Chonoi, who, as we'll see, holds like Rabbi Yehoshua in one respect, and like Rabbi Eliezer in one respect. It's not Yosef ben Chonoi Omer, he agrees with Rabbi Eliezer that if you take an animal that is a shlomim and you shecht it for the sake of a Pesach, so then the animal is puzzle, and therefore if you would do it on Shabbos, you'd be liable for a korban chatas. But Alma pesulo begufo, he says, you see that it's a pesul beguf. However, umishum hachi yisarif miyad, but it can be, but rather, it can be burnt right away. However, uve pituri, however, when it comes to being liable for bring, uh, for doing a malacha on Shabbos, savr la ke Rebbe Yehoshu. He holds like Rebbe Yehoshu, who says, toa bitvar mitzvah's potter. Since you're in the process of doing a mitzvah when you do this act, and therefore you should not be held liable, uh, therefore he's of the opinion that um, that you're going to be potter in this case. So Yosef bar Barcha ben Chonoi holds that in one respect, I agree with Rabbi Eliezer that this animal is intrinsically possible, and that's why it can be burned right away. But on the other hand, I hold like Rabbi Hoshua, who says that even though I've done a malacha, but I'm toy a bitvar mitzvah, and therefore I'm going to be potter from a korban chatas. Wow. Okay, so that's so that's how you explain the brisa. But once again, we're still holding cup that what? That Rav holds that the transition from asham to non-asham and from Pesach to non-Pesach happens automatically. So the Gemara says, Rav Ashi Omar, Rav Ashi has a different approach. He says, Rav to Omar ke Rabbi Yishmol ben Oshel Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka. He holds up the following b'risa. The Tani Rabbi Yishmol ben Oshel Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka Omer, Im ye shohus bayom leida, im ashchu balam esyedem o shemei so shenitma u chayev, u tu ubar tzurasa v'yotze lebeis asrefa. He says two statements. He says, number one, that which our Mishnah says that if the animal, if I shechted the Korban Pesach and only afterwards I discover that it was ownerless because the owner died or he already did, he joined another Chabura or he was Tameh, then I'm not liable. So the first statement that Rabbi Shmuel makes is that's only true when that fact was not discoverable, when it was there was no time between the time that the person died and the time when I shechted the Korban Pesach to discover that he had died. But if the death had happened several hours ago, and all I had to do was make an inquiry to find out where the owner is, and they would have told me that the owner died, and I neglected to make that inquiry, so then I'm karov lipshia, then I've done something negligent, and therefore I have to bring a carbon chatas in that case. The second statement that he makes is, is that in that scenario, where you shech the carbon pesach and the animal is ownerless, then to ubar tsuraso v'yotze lebeis asreifa. Then the animal, you have to wait for the, the meat to decompose before you're allowed to burn it. My time, alav mishum de lo boi akira. It must be, be, be because Rabbi Shmuel of that b'risa holds, like Rav, that what? That the animal transitioned automatically from being a Pesach to being a, a Shlomim. And since the Shlomim's preclusion is only extrinsic and is not intrinsic, I have to wait till the meat decomposes before I can burn it. So the Gemara says, you see very clearly here that Rav is holding like this b'risa. Even though he may disagree with the previous b'risa that permits you to burn it right away, at least there's a b'risa that's supportive of Rav. But the Gemara says, but wait a minute. How do you know that that's the reason why Rabbi Shmuel requires you to let, cause the meat to decompose? Dilma mishum de savr la ketana devei rabba baravuha da omar afilu pigol nami boi ibert sura di olaf avon avon minosar. He says, maybe that's not the reason why uh, Rabbi Shmuel requires you 
to wait for the meat to decompose before you burn it. Maybe Rabbi Yishmoel is of the opinion that all karbanos that are pasal, before you burn them, you have to wait till the meat to decompose, even when the psul is intrinsic. And it's, it's, like, it's like the brysa that says that even pigle, which is clearly an intrinsic psul, you have to wait for the meat to decompose before you can burn it. And it's based on Xerah Shava from the laws of Nosar, where there too you have to wait till it decomposes before you can burn it. And he says, the elot, and so you don't really see from here that Rav has a Tana where he can hang his hat, because maybe this Tana also holds that the animal retains its status as a Pesach, but you still have to wait for it to decompose before you can burn it. He says, because if you don't say that, recall that one of the cases that Rabbi Shmuel had said that uh, you have to wait for it to decompose before you burn it is a case where the owner was Tame. And in that situation, surely everyone agrees that it retains its status as a carbon Pesach. Even Rav would have to agree to that because the owner plans to use it for Pesach Sheni. Because Havadai Boyakir, there you would for surely require explicit redesignation. The Amar Rabbi Chia Bargam, the Nizr Kami Pichabur, Kagon Shahayu Balam Tamei Meis, Venit Chula Pesach Sheni. There, remember, Rabbi Chia Bargamda had said that in that situation, even though the guy couldn't bring it on Erev Pesach, since he plans on bringing it for Pesach Sheni, the animal surely retains its status as a carbon Pesach. And yet, Rabbi Shmuel still holds, you have to wait till the animal decomposes. Why? It's got an intrinsic psul, if you shechted it now. It's got an intrinsic psul because it's not usable as the carbon Pesach. So why should you be allowed to, uh, why shouldn't you be allowed to burn it right away? So it must be because he holds this Rabbi Shmuel's b'risa is not a support of Rav. Rabbi Shmuel's b'risa holds the reason you have to wait is not because it automatically converts to a Pesach from a Pesach to a Shlamim, but rather because even intrinsic psulim, even though it retains the status as a carbon Pesach, you still have to wait 24 hours. So the Gemara says, you're right. We'll stick with our original answer, not like Ravashi. We'll stick with our original answer that the, the Rav... Is 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 um, Rav is in accord with Rebbe Yehoshua. Rav holds that the animal loses its status as a korban pesach automatically; it converts to a shlamim. But it's uh, but the brisa that says that you're allowed to burn it right away is going according to Yosef ben Chonoi, who holds like Rebbe Eliezer and says that if a korban shlamim is shechted for the sake of a korban pesach. That's called an intrinsic psul, and that's the reason why you're allowed to burn it right away. Not because, not because it didn't lose its status as a Pesach. It lost its status as a Pesach and converted into a Shlomim. But nevertheless, because I shechted it for the sake of a carbon Pesach, it acquires an intrinsic psul, and that's why I'm allowed to burn it right away. I hope you're able to follow that. If you could follow that, you're brilliant.